In my last video, I talked about the iPack H2215, a pocket PC from HP all the way back in 2003. Now, while the device itself is pretty interesting, I'm here in the second installment of Pocket PC-ish month to talk about some of its more unique hardware, peripheral cards. It seems strange today since smartphones seem to have every sensor known to man incorporated in some form, but back in the days of PDAs, it was pretty common to have expansion cards that plugged into the device for some type of special functionality. Going all the way back to the Newton, with its PCMCIA cards for added memory, Wi-Fi, and more. As time went on, of course, the cards got smaller, going from PCMCIA to Compact Flash to eventually SDIO, a special variant of SD cards that allowed them to act as peripherals rather than just storage devices. SDIO devices are pretty uncommon nowadays, and even if you find one, you'll also need a device that specifically supports the protocol, since most SD slots, even though they're physically and electrically compatible, won't work with SDIO devices. Thankfully, I have both an SDIO peripheral and a device that supports it, which brings me to the first iPack add-on, the HP PhotoSmart mobile camera. Probably the first thing of note with the PhotoSmart is the physical design of the device itself. At less than 2 inches wide, it doesn't add that much size onto the iPad. In that space though, the PhotoSmart houses a 1.3 megapixel camera with a 180 degree swivel mount, allowing you to take front facing pictures in the traditional sense, or flip it around and take them like this. The camera also has an adjustable lens, allowing for close ups within the range of a few inches, or an infinite focus. Now, I'll admit right away that I'm no expert on photography, but thankfully the PhotoSmart seems to have been designed mostly to be point and shoot. Simply inserting it into the top of the device launches the capture program. Then you can grab your stylus, which annoyingly is blocked by the camera, and start taking pictures. Besides the focus and a few simpler white balance options, the camera doesn't have very many useful settings to play around with. Photos can be taken at resolutions of up to 1280 by 1024 although with the IPAX 240p display, a fraction of which is actually used to show the live camera feed, it can be rather difficult to tell how a picture turned out or even if the object you want to capture is in focus. It also doesn't help that with how lightweight the whole thing is, along with the fact that you need to tap the touch screen with either a stylus or your thumbnail to take a photo, any longer distance shots are incredibly prone to motion blur from a jittery hand. Still, I tried my best to stay still and I got a couple interesting photos to look at, along with some comparison photos taken with my cell phone. I have to admit, even though it can be hard to do, when this thing takes a good picture, it takes a good picture. You can see here I was playing with the focus knob. The texture of these bricks, or the bark on the tree, are really well defined. Done right, close-ups with this camera can turn out really well, especially here where the macro mode blurs out the background. Photos at infinite focus can also turn out pretty sharply too. Though did you catch how I cheated here? The only way I can make these treetops turn out well was actually by holding the eye pack up against the tree. Here's a photo I took just holding the device in my hand. I wasn't kidding about the jitter thing. The color reproduction of this camera can also be pretty hit or miss. It's hard to tell on the IPAX display where all colors seem fairly muted, but on my PC screen there are photos where you can really tell they have a yellowed tint. Now, while some will say this is poor white balancing, I prefer to call this Groovy Vision, an undocumented filter in this camera that makes pictures look like they were taken decades ago. Groovy Vision seems to mostly occur in low light environments, explaining why most of my good photos were taken outside on a sunny day. The camera doesn't take very good low light photos, and without a flash it makes nearly any indoor photo turn out poorly. It doesn't help that to take a good photo you need bright light, and in bright light the glare makes it nearly impossible to actually see what's on the IPAX display. The camera can also take video, although that feature is fairly limited. Your options are 320x240p videos with a listed rate of 5 frames a second, or 160x120p videos that update more consistently at around 10 frames per second. Capturing a video will also record audio from the IPAX internal microphone, although it's so quiet I assumed at first that I had the audio disabled. Add in the size that a video file takes up for even just a few seconds in comparison with the size of the IPAX internal storage, since you can't have an SD card in while using the camera, and the video recording capabilities of the camera are pretty useless for anything other than taking a few quick clips. I will say though that the videos the camera records are a little endearing. They give off a sort of 2005 YouTube kind of vibe. In fact, who knows, there are probably videos on YouTube right now that were originally shot on a pocket PC. The thought of which makes me happy. I have to admit, I feel I've been pretty harsh on the PhotoSmart camera, but to be honest, at the time it came out in 2003, it actually was a pretty fair competitor to the actual digital cameras up for sale. 
Granted its resolution was lower, 1.3 megapixels against cameras generally between 3 to 6 megapixels, but what it lacked in resolution it more than made up for in portability. So long as you had your eye pack in the camera, either plugged in the top or stored in this little leather case it came in, you could take a photo anywhere, and the eye pack, even with the added size of the camera, was still far smaller than the so-called ultra-compact cameras at the time. It's also worth noting that this was a time when camera phones were in their infancy, with resolutions generally around 0.3 megapixels, and with hardly any of the adjustability of the PhotoSmart. Really, the camera's price best reflects its position in the market. At $130, it wasn't quite the cheap embedded phone camera, and it wasn't the dedicated digital camera. It was an in-between camera, and a darn good one at that. Whew, that was a lot to talk about the camera, but like I said, I do have two more things to show here today. Next up is the Faro's iGPS add-on. Simply slipping this 32x mushroom looking thing onto the top of your iPad now allows it to locate itself anywhere on Earth. Kinda. But first, we need to install the software it comes with, kindly provided on four CDs. While the program resides on one of them though, the rest contains segments of a map of the United States. After installing the software, you simply choose which maps you want to install, watch the program freeze up and crash, look through the files yourself, pull out what you need, and copy them to the SD card manually. It's that easy. Anyways, the actual program to use the GPS is pretty well featured. After inserting the GPS, you need to manually enable it and wait for a few satellites to determine where it is. I found that this pretty much never works inside, and outside usually requires you to go Lion King for a minute or two until it tracks down enough satellites. After that though, it can place you on the map, telling you your exact location accurate to about 10 feet in my experience. And that's just the beginning. Now you can enter in an exact waypoint and use the GPS to travel to it geocaching style, but you can also enter in an address, assuming it's on the 15 year old maps, and get full text or voice guided turn by turn directions to it. It seems trivial today, but I can imagine having the equivalent of Google Maps or MapQuest right in your pocket without buying a dedicated GPS was pretty handy. Last up is a program I mentioned briefly in my other iPack video. I did a bit of further reading on it, and it appears this was a special bundle with just my iPack model, so I figure it deserves a closer look. Nevo is a program utilizing the iPack's infrared communication abilities to turn your pocket PC into a universal remote. It's actually pretty cool. You just add an appliance, select the type, brand, and maybe a code specific to that model if necessary, and now you have a virtual remote on your iPack screen. There isn't really that much more to say. It just worked. My only real gripes are with the limited screen real estate, meaning you have to page through the buttons to get anywhere, and the latency between pressing a button and sending an action. Generally, this is okay, but it does make repeated button presses for things like changing the volume take forever. And there you have it for pocket PC add-ons. The two I demonstrated here are just a few examples of all sorts of peripherals designed for these things, like cards for wireless communications, cards for wired communications, and even cards with built-in modems. It seems strange now in a world with smartphones that need dedicated cables and plugs to add on any additional hardware to consider a time when expandability was one of the central features of a device, but in the world of pocket PCs and PDAs like them, that was the norm. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed the second installment into Pocket PC Ishma, taking a look at add-ons for Pocket PCs. Be sure to watch my review of the iPack Pocket PC itself if you haven't already, and stay tuned for the next installment, where we'll take a look at a dropped Microsoft project arguably ahead of its time.